Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Fantasy Football Films. On today's episode, I'm going to be giving my full analysis on the Rams' backfield and what it's going to look like for the 2019 fantasy football year. I'll also be looking at the NFL film evaluating Daryl Henderson and showing why I think he's a great breakout candidate for 2019. For those of you who aren't following the NFL as closely year to year, Todd Gurley has been the unquestioned top fantasy option for the past two years. However, towards the end of last season, issues of his arthritic knees arose, preventing him from seeing the field. The Rams actually ended up signing C.J. Anderson later in the year, who pretty much took over the starting running back job. I would know as my fantasy football season took a dive once this happened. So you can all understand this situation is close to my heart. The Rams were still able to maintain a somewhat effective running game, but the backfield didn't look the same without the help of Gurley. So the question this season is, where are we going to value Gurley before the season? Had he been healthy, he would be the number one overall pick without question. But a flurry of news reports and roster moves do not breathe confidence into this situation. The bottom line I want to get across during this episode is that the Rams backfield is going to look very different next year, in my opinion. And I've decided to dedicate this episode explaining my analysis on the situation of the offense and, of course, the Rams third round draft pick, Daryl Henderson. But before I dive in, I want to make something crystal clear. This is only an analysis. I don't want to stake my reputation on this occurring as there is a significant amount of confusion over what Los Angeles is doing. The honest truth is no one knows what is really going to happen for sure. I just want to make an argument for Daryl Henderson as well as Todd Gurley in 2019. So with that being said, let's start off with knees specifically the Cadillac of knees that are attached to Todd Gurley. Of course, I wanted to mention that I am a medical student uh, when I'm not in a dark room watching NFL film, so I do have a decent background with this information, uh, but I, I do not want people to consider me a figure of authority on this matter. Only that I do study medicine, um, but I am just a student, so don't consider this gospel. Anyways, Todd Gurley was reported to be suffering from a condition known as degenerative arthritis. This is essentially synonymous with the term osteoarthritis, which your grandma or grandpa end up getting when they get older. The mechanism of this disease is the same. See, your knee, like all joints in your body, are capped by a cartilage surface, the lightish blue section you see on your screen. Over time, that cartilage wears down and the chondrocytes are unable to regenerate the joint surface. That means that you will have bone on bone friction, which can end up being fairly painful with movement. This can be triggered by many things, including heavy wear, but also knee injuries, which Gurley has suffered a torn ACL in college. With the bone on bone joint, this can create flare ups of inflammation if overused, but typically subsides with significant rest. The bottom line is that once someone has degenerative arthritis, they have it for life in the absence of some sort of knee replacement surgery, which would likely end Gurley's career. What essentially happened last year for Gurley is the wear on the knees created significant pain and inflammation that persisted throughout the, re the remainder of the season, mainly because it wasn't possible for him to rest for a month or two to allow the joint to recover because the season would be over by that time. Thus, the Rams were forced to replace Gurley's production because it became evident he was not going to be able to endure the remainder of the season and playoffs. Now that Gurley has had an entire offseason to rest, his knees are likely good to go relatively, but now we know the limit of usage and what will happen if this flares up again. Therefore, the Rams have to be proactive at securing multiple options that are going to help limit the wear on the tire, so to speak, so they can prolong the health of their running back star and ensure that he's available for the postseason at full strength. Before I move on though, I'll mention that everything regarding this knee situation says that Gurley is at an increased risk of getting injured this year. Not only is he at risk of this flaring up again, but the arthritis in the knee reduces the range of motion, which predisposes him to soft tissue injur injuries like hamstrings and such. So Gurley should be good to go, but is likely going to be limited throughout the year, and I do not believe it's realistic or smart for the Rams to give him the workload he has had previously. The next factor is Sean McVay's offense. 
which at its foundation is a very simple set of play calls. However, the nuance and deadly threat of the LA offensive scheme is due to the intricate tag system that McVay employs. A tag is a play call adjustment that is installed as part of the playbook. For example, I could pl uh, call a play with a crossing route and then employ a tag called HBO smash, for example. The play call comes into the quarterback who call calls out the play in the huddle with a tag at the end. So a play call that was originally called 22 pro right mesh seam would now be 22 pro right mesh seam HBO smash. The tag at the end of the play is a command to the route runners to alter their original routes, which could be any number of adjustments like adjusting the depth of their crossing route, their zone read, or curl depth. The tags McVay would call on a given play would be dependent on his film study, defensive alignment, personnel, etc. Because McVay is such a student of the modern NFL, his dedication to understanding opposing defenses is what makes defending the Rams so difficult. All in all, the offense isn't as unique as people would have you think, minus the tag system, and it's fairly easy to run so long as the offensive players can remember each tag on a given play. It does, however, rely on an effective running game. So as long as the Rams can line up and move the ball efficiently on the ground, the defense cannot dedicate extra defensive backs to plug up passing zones that could otherwise be exploited by McVay. The teams that have found success against the Rams have done so by maximizing their ability to stop the run and preventing deep routes from springing open downfield. This has forced Goff to dink and dunk his way downfield, which he could do all day if he wanted to against that defensive strategy. However, if you have a superior defense and good running game, you essentially force the Rams into a classic low scoring football trenches slugfest, which they have traditionally struggled with during McVay's tenure. So the Rams offense is not invincible, but shutting down the run game is much easier said than done. McVay's greatest trait as a coach, however, is that he learns from his mistakes. In 2018, there are a couple of takeaways that are key to his success this year. First, they need Gurley, or a Gurley clone that can puncture holes in an opposing defense. No, they can't just have any old running back. They need to have a dynamic weapon that allows McVay to open up the downfield secondary. The second thing he learned was Gurley's time as a workhorse is over. As you can see, these two things conflict with one another. How do you get Gurley production without Todd Gurley? Obviously, you can't sign another high-profile running back. But like I said, Coach McVay learns, and this includes recognition of what is currently successful in the NFL and adopting it to their own offense. McVay's offensive scheme is a Frankenstein of modern NFL influences. You see a little bit of Gruden, Mike Leach, Kyle Shanahan. After all, plagiarism is the greatest form of flattery. So where in the NFL would he find an offensive scheme component that would reduce his need to run Gurley every single play while maintaining high running game efficiency. In other words, which team in the NFL can run the ball with great efficiency without a heavy workload on its running backs? McVay does come from the same coaching tree as Kyle Shanahan, but only one team truly comes to mind when you consider true running back timeshare efficiency, and they are coached by someone with the same first name. Enter Sean Payton another premier play caller in the NFL who has been the head coach of the Saints since 2006 and faced Sean McVay in the NFC Championship only to lose because of a missed pass interference. The Saints boast one of, if not the most dominant run game in the NFL and it features a split backfield. It is also featured by Alvin Kamara, who's a top three pick in this year's fantasy football drafts. Sean Payton has constructed the template for the Rams running game. All the Rams really have to do is find their Alvin Kamara. Well, let's wind the clock back to the beginning of the 2019 offseason, which began with the tendering of restricted free agent Malcolm Brown and CJ Anderson's expired contract. Clearly, the Rams valued Malcolm Brown's presence heavily to re-sign him after Detroit attempted to acquire him. A lot of fantasy football analysts took this as clear evidence that Malcolm Brown was the backup to Todd Gurley. But hold on. Wait just a minute. Brown was originally an undrafted free agent who has been with the Rams since 2015, which of note was the same year Todd Gurley was drafted. He has never handled or been trusted with a significant workload. 
In fact, the Rams went out and signed aging veteran C.J. Anderson in the middle of last season to take over the change of pace duties in L.A. once Todd Gurley's knee started to flare up. Why would the Rams choose to hand over 35 or more percent touches to Brown? Don't get me wrong, Malcolm Brown is a good backup to Gurley, but that's all he is in my eyes. The Rams don't want a backup, they want a weapon. Fast forward to the draft where they took Daryl Henderson in the third round with their second pick in the 2019 draft. Investing draft capital that early in the draft says that they are looking for an offensive weapon, not a bench piece or depth. They invested in Henderson because they want another offensive weapon to provide good running back or running back receiving production when Gurley is not on the field. They're Camara, so to speak. Before I get to the film, I'll go ahead and state my predictions for the 2019 season. Again, I'm not staking my reputation on this occurring, but this is what my analysis is telling me. First, Henderson is going to take over a significant portion of the Rams rushing offense. Gurley will still be the lead back so long as he remains healthy, but Henderson is going to be utilized within this offense as a reliable running back threat. A lot of his value really is going to be dependent on Gurley's health because Todd Gurley is still going to be the primary option. However, it's going to be tough for the Rams to keep Gurley on the field and thus should open up plenty of opportunities for Henderson. The two things that I will say with near certainty is Henderson is the true number two back in Los Angeles and Gurley is not going to be the same workhorse that he has been in the past. So how good can Hen Henderson be in fantasy football? Before we get to the film, I want to discuss the two primary run schemes, gap and zone, because understanding the basics of the two allow you to recognize the running back's ability to adapt to one or the other. First is the gap scheme. The gap blocking scheme takes advantage of a blocker's angle on a defender, maximizing the offensive lineman's leverage. Here, the backside guard is going to pull and kick out the play side defensive end eventually opening up the quote-unquote gap for the running back to run through. The running back's job is fairly easy as he just has to wait for the blockers to get downfield, open up the hole, and explode through it. It's slightly more complicated than that, but for our purposes, that's all you need to know. Next is the zone blocking scheme, which has essentially been universally adopted to the NFL. Instead of the lineman blocking a particular defender, the offensive line is responsible for blocking a particular zone. The reason this has been more widely adopted in the NFL is because it doesn't necessarily rely on the physical traits of an offensive lineman because the whole scheme is designed for the defense to beat itself. If one defensive tackle overcommits or slants to either side, the lineman assigned to that zone just carries him out of the way so the lineman doesn't have to have leverage or physically push the defense out of the way. The key is having intuitive blockers as well as a running back that has good zone running technique, which is to first accelerate towards the primary hole and press the line of scrimmage. Pressing involves an initial deceleration of the running back and then face his hips parallel along the offense or the line of scrimmage. During his press, the running back will read the movement of the line and identify the appropriate lane, which for our purposes will be called the bang, the bend, and the bounce. If the play side defensive tackle slants towards the bang running lane, the center just carries that tackle to the right out of the zone. The running back will read that the defensive tackle is being carried to the right and then bend his running lane over the backside hip of the center where the running lane will uh, inevitably develop. Again, there's a lot more nuance with zone running schemes, but so long as you understand that it involves intuitive linemen, the defense beating itself essentially, and the running back isn't reading one particular hole, you understand it enough for me to discuss Daryl Henderson, who comes from a gap scheme in college. He has been criticized for struggling to learn the zone scheme that is being run in LA, but I believe this is uh, incredibly overblown. Not that running backs don't struggle to make that adjustment, but I believe he's still an effective running back. A couple of videos of him early in training camp don't really create an accurate picture of him as an NFL player. Our first play, as all three plays of this episode, is from week three preseason game against the Broncos. 
I wasn't able to get a hold of the coaching film for this episode, so the angles are not as good, but I still thought it was adequate to prove my points about Henderson. The Rams are running a weak side zone with Henderson in the backfield. I will note that this is not the starting offensive line for the Rams, and they are facing off with multiple defensive starters for the Broncos. I'll stop it here to show that the majority of Broncos are slanting to the main play side of the line. I will also draw up the bang, bend, and bounce running lanes. Because the Broncos are shifting towards what would be the left side of the offensive line linemen, the blockers will have leverage on the defense's right shoulder. So the appropriate read for Henderson is to bend his run back to the right side of the line. On this play, Henderson was only able to get five yards, but that's really a product of the blocking talent not being starters. Even so, five yards on a given run play is still pretty productive. I do think Henderson is not as consistent as of yet at reading zone runs, but he is improving week by week. The next play is a classic inside zone run to the right. Henderson receives the handoff and as he begins pressing, identifies his offensive lineman being blown up into the backfield. Ideally, this would be the point of leverage for the running back to run along the strong side hip of the lineman and accelerate into the would-be running lane. However, Henderson shows that he is indeed attempting to read his lineman who is just trying to press his defender out of the way. The lineman really isn't allowing the scheme to do its job. Ideally, the lineman is going to shift his hips in one direction and carry the defender into the backfield out of the running lane. However, Henderson doesn't really do him any favors. He is indecisive and crashes directly into the defender rather than cutting into an appropriate running lane. This was just a highlight that it is evident that Henderson isn't fully confident with the system yet, but he is improving pretty fast compared to the beginning of training camp. Who would have thought that NFL rookies wouldn't be perfect in a new scheme on day one of their professional career? I do think that with adequate blocking, he has the ability to break off huge plays. He will need to continue to develop his reconsistency to ensure he is trusted in real game situations, but I do have confidence that he will. The final play is called a split zone run. The play side tight end is going to pull to the back side of the formation to free up some of the blockers on the right side of the line. This is probably the Eagles' favorite running play, but you'll see it all over the NFL as a complement to a zone scheme. Once again, we see the lineman getting blown up into the backfield and the tight end crashing into his own blocker. Because that lineman got pushed so far in the backfield, it disrupted the tight end's ability to seal the backside edge. So the bend lane for Henderson to cut back into is not established. This is what happens when you have bad blocking and you're trying to run the ball. The play cannot work as designed, so Henderson is forced to accelerate through the bang running lane to get back to the line of scrimmage or pick up three or four yards if you're fast and skilled enough, which is what Henderson is able to do and salvage broken blocking. I chose this play just to show that you can't really use the eye test necessarily with Henderson. You kind of have to get into the details of the run scheme to see what is really going on and that Henderson is a good running back and can be an offensive weapon given the correct blocking. A statement was made on the broadcast that Henderson needs to be able to create big plays even with bad blocking, which is partially true, but difficult when you're only given the ball five or six times on a given week. Also, Todd Gurley was nowhere near as productive with bad blocking. Give him a good offensive line and it changes people's entire perspective. So for fantasy values, I have Daryl Henderson rated as a round seven to nine running back in a 12 team PPR draft that has a good potential to develop into an RB1 as the NFL season goes forward. Another argument people have made against Henderson is that he received touches in the preseason while the other starters were not active, suggesting he isn't a starter and Brown was indeed the number two back. This is what I'll say to that. No, Todd Gurley is the star of the Rams backfield, yes, but put yourself in McVay's shoes. If you have a young running back you are trying to assimilate to the NFL game, 
who needs to learn to run the zone at the NFL level, who may or may not have been receiving enough reps in practice since you still need to give a lot of reps to Gurley. How do you develop him? You give him preseason reps. Not a heavy workload, but enough for him to get the feel and get his pads popped a few times so he can get used to running the zone come game time. I truly believe he's the number two back in Los Angeles. Um, however, realistically, he's going to finish as a low-end RB2 to high-end RB3. Only if Todd Gurley is managed to perfection and has no setback, which I think is an unlikely scenario. Finally, I'll give my thoughts on Gurley. He would be the number one pick overall had he been healthy, but clearly this is not the case. However, I think he will receive a healthy amount of volume and be spelled enough in the offense to maintain RB1 numbers. You just are taking a significant risk that his knee ends up flaring up again. You have a pretty wide spectrum of fantasy outcomes with Gurley, but I think he's worth the risk midway through the second round of a 12-team PPR draft. And that concludes another episode. Make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you like our content. You can follow me on Twitter at RobFFFilms. I'm Robert Athey. Thanks for watching.